Good morning for those of you who are logged into our webinar. Thank you for joining us. Um, we hope you enjoy it. Uh, just a little precursor. This is any of you expecting a, a totally technical presentation. Uh, this is not going to be one of those. Uh, the presentation is a kind of a layman's uh, way of describing the security issues we face at the moment, uh, the ransomware, the malware that's pervasive in the world. So uh, let's carry on on that basis. Steve, over to you. Morning, everyone. Um, as you know, David, myself, mine, and Zach are from Arntree. And we thought it would just be appropriate to um, do this webinar at this particular time, because obviously cyber attacks are becoming more relevant in that they've been commercialized. So we're seeing a very different world now than we have been seeing. Um, there have been ransomware attacks that have, been ta that have taken out huge businesses, as I'm sure most of you are aware, but also where there's money to be made, people become very inventive. And, you know, size of business doesn't really matter. So obviously the larger targets they will go for, but we as Arntree who have um, probably 15,000 businesses using our software, we're coming about these attacks on a weekly basis. And, and I think that it's time for people to take it more seriously. Um, South Africa, as you can see, point three ranks number eight in the world of cyber attacks. Now, if you think about that, um, we kind of a crossover between a first and a third world country. So while South Africa is so high up on the list after all the countries in Europe, and I think the reason for that is uh, probably South Africans are too trusting. And uh, that's what this, this seminar is about. Um, I made a point to Zach, uh, for my sins, I do smoke occasionally. And what I find interesting is that, you know, everybody knows that smoking is very bad for you. And you see it loudly displayed on cigarette boxes that smoking can kill you. Um, and I think because you see it so in front of your face, you think it will never happen to you. And I kind of get the feeling that the same thing's happening with uh, cybersecurity, ransomware attacks. You read about it everywhere. And it's so common that you probably think that it won't happen to you. And I think it's something to just keep in mind as we move through this presentation. What I'm particularly excited about is that Antri, uh, you know, has always been in the, in the business of backing up. And, and um, we have found that the cybersecurity attacks have become so prevalent that we've employed an expert, Mayan, who's going to take you through a practical demonstration of what happens when a cyber attack, particularly ransomware, uh, infects your, your environment. And once again, I'm a very practically orientated person and you read all the stuff about attacks, but I always think like, what actually happens on the machine? And that's what Mayan's going to take us through. Thanks, Steve. I just want to make a point there. The, the second point on the slide, that uh, traditional endpoint security or antivirus security doesn't protect you anymore. And it's kind of like, you know, if, you, if in your house you've got, you've got insurance and a, a locked door, doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to get robbed. So you need these different layers of security. And part of what we, we do at Iron Tree is we provide a proper malware or cyber security as opposed to uh, just the traditional antivirus, which just looks at patterns that are known. Uh, and and get updated once a day. So you, you only get protected from uh, uh, a malware or a, or a virus that gets updated based on what happened yesterday. Um, just as an example, we have a, a customer, uh, a, a one of our channel partners who's got a customer with 28 workstations and a, and a server. They put proper uh, cybersecurity uh, protection on their server. Uh, and they thought that the 27 or 28 desktops could just use traditional antivirus. And what happened is they actually got uh, infiltrated through one of the, the workstations, which, which just had traditional antivirus, and it took out their whole network. So you need to have your entire environment protected. Uh, and just to, why, yeah, sorry, to, to add to that, um, you're never going to be 100% secure, but it's all about, like you said, 
adding those layers of defense to your environment and your network. And you're going to be a lot closer to, to secure than the others, but you're never going to be 100% secure. It all comes down to how much you know and user education. Well, I think my, on, on that point, I'd like to say if you've got, if you compare it to the house analogy, if you've yes. got a, a, a insurance and you've got a lock on your door and you've got an alarm and you've got an electric fence and your alarm's linked to an arm response company and you've got bright lights outside at night, you, you're, not, you're not totally protected, but the, it's a the big deterrent. It's going to go to the house yeah. next door. Yes. Um, so, so this slide I actually took for those of you who read the Daily Maverick. We actually took these uh, these slide these figures from a slide that was published in the Daily Maverick, which was, uh, uh, as you can see, based on a survey of a thousand plus uh, uh, managed service providers. Um, uh, someone, I think, Yako made the point earlier that the, the most prevalent ways of getting uh, hit are, are human. Uh, error, if you want to call it that. So, phishing email, someone clicking on an email which is not legitimate, poor user practices and gullibility, just uh, clicking on a mail which which you kind of know doesn't look right, but it's it's attractive, um, and lack of training amongst others. So, I, I just thought this was an interesting slide. I'm going to move off it unless you want to say anything more about that, Steve. And um, what I do want to say about it is once again. You're looking at this, what does it really mean? Uh, I mean, this is really the attacker's entrance into your environment. So to, to infect you with ransomware, they need an in. And this is the in. Phishing emails, you can see are 50%, 54% of the um, recorded mannerisms which person gets in. So you get an email, it looks innocuous, you click on something, and then all of a sudden you've kind of opened the front door to your house. That's the way that you should think about it. And then you can see that the first couple of things really all relate to staff education. And I think that ignorance really is bliss for these attackers. So just try and, try and make your employees and your, in your, your organization aware. Absolutely. And if I could, if I could just interject with all of you guys, just for anyone who's watching now, if you have any questions about what's uh, going on on the screen, if you want something clarified or expanded further, you're welcome to pop any questions into, into chat. So for instance, RDP access, just as a clarification, if you don't know what that is, that's remote desktop um, programs, that kind of stuff. So just a, a heads up for everyone involved. If you need anything clarified, don't, don't hesitate to ask. Yeah, thanks, Zach. I just did, did want to discuss that point about open RDP access. RDP is a remote desktop protocol. That's what you would use to access a remote server. Or if you're at home, you're accessing your office server or a server in the cloud. It's very important to make sure that you host with a service provider that gives you a secure uh, remote uh, connection. And then clickbait, for those of you who don't understand, and as I said in the beginning, our intention here is really to explain in layman's terms what this is all about. Clickbait is a term you probably all heard. What is clickbait? It's when you're on a website or a news site or something, and you see a little photo of like um, something that, that you kind of know in your mind is like crazy, like, um, um, you know, uh, look at Clint Eastwood's house when he's 90 and you're like, <laughs> why would you even click on it? But you do. And it's actually got nothing to do with Clint, Clint Eastwood or his house. That's called clickbait. It just entices you to click on a link that's actually going to expose you to uh, a cyber uh, criminal hacking into your environment. Okay. I'm going to hand back to our our uh, tame cybersecurity expert, Mayan, to just give us a bit of a view of, of what is ransomware, Mayan? Right, so ransomware, um, it falls under malicious software or malware, and it's essentially a program or code that manages to infect your computer systems and then proceeds to corrupt and encrypt your data and files and then demands a reasonably hefty ransom for the release of the said data and files. And, you know, with modern ransomware, a lot of the times they don't just encrypt and corrupt your data, they actually back it up on the attacker side and demand ransom in a form of leverage. 
Okay. So essentially, it's it's malicious um, software that we'll show in the in the simulated attack a little bit later that actually denies you access to your own files until you pay someone to release them. Well, Dave, can I say that you can have access to your files, but they're useless because they're encrypted, so you yeah. can't use them. Yeah. Okay. So. What, what, how is ransomware made possible? And some of you might have seen some of our webinars during lockdown where we discussed this, but very easily, it's quite amazing to me if you think about it. And when I talk to my friends and tell them this, they're like, why didn't we think of the, about this? It's so simple. Cryptocurrency. Before we had cryptocurrency, it was impossible to have ransomware because how did you actually get people to pay? You could encrypt their files and then say, well, do an EFT or uh, uh, put in your, you know, here's my credit card details or, um, you know, something like that. But it was traceable. So you couldn't actually be a cyber criminal demanding money without being traced. Cryptocurrency has enabled cybercrime to become an incredibly profitable enterprise and, and almost untrackable. Uh, uh, some people say that cybercrime is a bigger enterprise than, than the drug trade. I'm not sure how true that is, but certainly in the sort of billions of dollars um, um, category. Um, and, and we see it happening not only overseas, even spoken about, he mentioned, you've seen, you know, overseas, the, the, the colonial oil pipeline got attacked by cyber criminals and ransomware, and they stopped the oil supply. But locally, I mean, Steve, I don't know if you want to talk about the Virgin Active example, which is sort of really close to home. Well, the Virgin Active was a great one for me. I mean, um, just to keep myself sane, I swim at five o'clock every morning. And... Um, it was amazing going in there one day and all of a sudden the turnstiles didn't work. Um, down to even, you know, when you're having coffee, you can browse the internet through Virgin's wireless network. That was down. And you could see it caused massive embarrassment and people had to fill out forms because with discovery, you like kind of get points through vitality. And everything had to be handwritten. And the person had to see your ID to see that you were allowed into the gym. And it was just a really real example of how this affects a business. Um, and it took them probably three weeks to recover from this attack. And they weren't too open about it, but I'd imagine that they didn't want to pay the, the ransom. But it just caused massive embarrassment, massive admin issues. I mean, they've got probably 100 gym, 200 gyms around the country. They couldn't collect data. Turnstiles wouldn't open. And it just became a massive nightmare for them. And I thought, what could be good about that is maybe South Africans, because a lot of us use Virgin Active and go to gym, hopefully, they could see how prevalent this, this threat is. And so, it's amazing uh, the reach that ransomware attacks have. I mean, you mentioned that even the turnstiles were inoperable. Yeah. 100%. Because, I mean, the RD, you know, if you go yeah. through a turnstile, it scans your card, it looks it up on a database and sees if it's relevant. The database had been encrypted. What was amazing to me, and the most important part about this really, besides the fact that you have to pay to get access to your data, is the disruptive effect. So, I mean, as a user, for me at Virgin Active, it was disruptive because I had to write my name down every time I went through the turnstile. But from Virgin Active point of view, they, they, I guess, I can't be sure, but every time I went there, I'd say, well, when are your systems going to be up? And the guys at the reception would say, another two weeks, another 10 days. I can only imagine the disruption within a business if you literally have to kind of reformat or get a new server and reinstate all your data. The cost of that is really just in inestimate. And it's happening not only to big businesses, it's happening to small businesses as well. Um, this slide, um, the, the, the text uh, I'm, I'm told by Zach uh, is Russian for did you know? And the did you know part of this is two things. That firstly, you probably did know that most of these uh, ransomware attacks originate somewhere in Eastern Europe or the um, Russian Republic. Um, uh, that's the part you did know. Um, Who's involved? Well, I mean, you know, you could guess that Putin's probably one of the beneficiaries. <laughs> if I say that. Um, but the interesting thing about it, about it Ma, is what mine was telling us the other day about um, Russian language computers. Mine, if you just give us that little tidbit. Yeah, for sure. So 
it's not it's it's a a good method to defend yourself from ransomware per se but it's not necessarily set in stone and that is that the russian well more specifically eastern european ransomwares that are created they are actually designed to detect um whether a computer has a russian language pack installed and this is a little bit political and that's because Russia has a policy that they will not pay out ransoms to Russian affected companies. So if the ransomware detects, okay, this computer has a Russian language back on it, then it will go to the one that has a American or English US language back on it. So it's yeah. a, it's a little, a small little tweak that you can put on your computer to defend yourself from Eastern European ransomware. <laughs> Yeah, just just to, ex, just to expand. It's not necessarily it's majority Russian, but yeah. um, it, it, a lot of it. And the joke here is 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 sort of like it's hinted at with the flag, but a lot of it comes from specifically ex USSR yeah. um, delegates. So it's it's not it's like let's say it's like uh, it's majority Russian, but you know if you do your research, you can find any any yeah. uh, keyboard from said region and uh, and add that to your layer of defenses. And most of it, not all, but most of it are state sponsored. So it's actually governments that are sponsoring these groups to launch these attacks, which is quite shocking. Okay. Some other interesting stuff. We, you know, you've all heard of the Internet of Things. People talk all about the Internet of Things. So what is the Internet of Things? The Internet of Things is a is our universe of devices that are connected to the internet. And yes, it's our computers, it's our tablets, it's our mobile phones, but think about it. It's it's the fridge at home that sends you a message that you know you low on milk. It's, uh, it's your home alarm system that you can actually view the cameras and disarm and arm remotely on your mobile device. It's, uh, Stephen likes to tell me his little robotic vacuum cleaner that uh, vacuums up the house and uh, is potentially transmitting photos of him in his pajamas to someone somewhere in the world. Um, and and um, the two, um, uh, the one strange incident that we read about was a fish tank in the casino. So the fish tank actually had a, a thermometer in the casino that was an Internet of Things device. In other words, it had a, 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 a chip in that was transmitting data to somebody's mobile phone that they could actually monitor the, the temperature of the fish tank so that the fish didn't die. And the casino actually got hacked because someone hacked through the thermometer because what happens is with these Internet of Things devices, your fridge, your security cameras, your, your robotic vacuum cleaner, you, you typically don't change the password. So it will be the default password with the software when it's installed. And if you think about it, once you can hack into one device on that wireless network, it's not difficult if you're a, a mine type person. Mine, I'm not saying you would do that, but it's not difficult to in, infiltrate the, the entire network. Uh, Steve, you want to add anything to that? No, just uh, that vacuum cleaner, which, by the way, I can only recommend. Um, it actually draws a map of your house and, and cleans it and remembers. But there's a friend of mine who's very switched on. He actually disabled the internet vibe of it and wrote his own software to run the vacuum cleaner because he didn't want, I think it was, I'm not going to mention the country, but uh, he said, Stephen, it's a risk because they can hack into your wireless network and it's a, it's a, it's a little door that's open for them. So he actually wrote in machine level coding uh, and controls his vacuum cleaner himself. But this is becoming so prevalent. Uh, yeah, David, we read about the Internet of Things probably 10 years ago. And I mean, it's not, uh, it's not out of imagination where you think about Tesla. Imagine saying like, because uh, obviously Tesla is very connected to the Internet, those electric cars. Imagine saying uh, your doors are locked and unless you pay ransom, we're not going to open the doors. And I really think that this is the last mile of the Internet because personally, I love the Internet for the way it spreads education. I mean, the social media part of it, I hate but it is such an enlightened way to educate the world. So I love it for that. But this last mile needs to be dealt with on the risk that the internet presents. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean, let's not uh, forget about the great advances that uh, Internet of Things allows. And I think particularly, I know it's totally off the topic of this webinar, but guys who've developed technology with drones that they can actually analyze um, um, farmlands, mm. uh, the, the moisture and the yield and, and which part of the vineyard is the best to grow grapes. I mean, it's incredible advances, but it also, unless you've got proper secure um, uh, access, it also exposes you to, to uh, cyber crime. Um, before we, we do the simulation, we're just going to talk about the uh, most current strain of ransomware. Um, and once again, I'm going to ask mine to talk a little bit about it, or maybe mine I'll hand over to you in a second. But what this, uh, yeah, the, this is an interesting one. The, the, the ransomware called uh, Revel or Revel. And what, what happened here is that this is a strain of ransomware that um, exposed businesses networks through a remote support tool that their service provider uses so some of you might have a, a support company that um, supports your your network and they don't come to your office they actually log on using a remote support tool you've heard of these things like team viewer and kaseya and you know a whole lot of others um, and what happened is um, Cyber criminals managed to, to hack into the actual remote support software. And through that, they actually um, attacked companies with ransomware. Now, I want to add that wasn't the fault of any support company. So if you're thinking, well, I better tell my support company or you know, whoever they are to stop using remote software, that would be not um, reasonable. It wasn't the fault of the support company. It wasn't the fault of the businesses who got hacked. It wasn't a user problem that they got fished or they they were gullible or they didn't, you know, it, it was just something that happened because the software itself wasn't secure. So that's a different level of attack. Um, and how do you prevent that? You prevent it by having proper cyber security measures on your network. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, uh, Dave, I just want to add, I mean, something that's shifted for me in the last year is the kind of bringing together backups and cyber security. And I like that story because... Yeah, I always used to say, have you got a anti, uh, antivirus loaded and oh, you're backing up? They were two separate things. But I think in today's world and specifically with Entry version 2, we've brought the two worlds together on one console. Because think about it, if all else fails, and let's say you did get ransomware, but you had made a backup last night, well, then at least you can restore that backup. And, 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 and then at least you're safe. So we've actually brought the two functionalities together on one console. So you can see your backups, how current they are, you can see your vulnerabilities. And something that I'd like you to discuss, Man, when you go through your presentation, and I'm sure it's on the, in everyone's brain, is does this ransomware affect my backup? Because if it infiltrated the backup, then you've got a real problem. So then I suppose it comes into versions of your backup. Because, you know, maybe it affected last night's backup, but not two days before. And that's something that people need to be aware of. But because it's built up, built into our backup software, we can detect these, this encryption of data and say, you know, something looks weird and your backups may be affected. Thanks, Steve. Okay, so we're going to ask mine to switch to, to geek mode now. And he's going to do a simulated um, ransomware attack. Uh, you, we're with no protection in place, and then another one where we do have protection in place, and I'll show you the differences when you're protected and when you're not. So, Mine, I'm going to ask you to share your screen. Right. There we go. So, yeah, as you can see, here is a Windows 10 virtual machine. Um, for the test data, I just have some cats and dogs photos because who doesn't have cats and dogs photos on their computer? Um, obviously, in a real world enterprise environment, this would be stuff like financial information, Word documents, Excel documents, what have you. So just to show you, these are in fact cats and dogs photos and there's nothing strange about them. They are working as much as a photo can work. All right, so here I have a email which seems 
pretty legit. I mean, it's from easy solutions tech support. So that would be maybe the managed service provider that I use or that the organization I work for use or, you know, whatever example. The thing about these types of attacks is the attackers will spend months and possibly even years researching and gathering information on their targets to tailor these specific attacks to their needs. So obviously this is not a very advanced attack, but you would receive an email and it would be directly from, for instance, easy solutions, tech support, same email address and everything. And you'll think, okay, this is a legitimate email. They would intercept Tomorrow, those emails. Yeah. Sorry, I just want to stop. They clever enough to make the email come from a business you deal with or a source. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And what they what they can also do is it's called a man in the middle attack, where they actually intercept the email communications between the client and well the recipient and the sender. So okay. they will then they are able to if there's an attachment in the email they can just reroute that email to their address and change the attachment quickly and continue sending it onwards. It's okay. a bit more advanced and not as common, but it's still possible. Yes. So yeah, so this would be then the email says that I've requested an urgent recovery of my backup. So they've created a backup recovery tool. And I have to follow. Come on, just stop there for a second. Just hover over that link. Mm -hmm. I want to see the, the actual address. Okay, well, you could see there that that's going to a very funny looking address. Yeah. Normally, if you hover over the link, if you get a, an a email, and, and I don't know about you, know, you guys watching, but I'm getting emails every day from Standard Bank, your IT3E certificate yeah. this year. And if you hover over that link, you can always see that it's not a legitimate link. So that's the first thing to check. Yes. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Mark. You can follow on through there. I'm going to just wrap one more time. You can follow on through there. Often the email address will be slightly incorrect as well. Yeah. So your your first sign port of call, say, let's let's go back to your email mind. Let's let's say what will happen is your real your real security management uh, firm are easy pen test without a full stop in their email. Yeah. And what, what a lot of these guys will do is they'll just add a, an innocuous thing in the middle of an email that makes it look almost virtually identical. So it's little things to look out for. And also a lot of the times you'll notice that there is quite a few spelling mistakes in the email due to the fact that most of these attacks come from countries where English is not their first language. So therefore, a lot of these will have very obvious spelling mistakes. Okay, mine, carry on with your simulation. All right, so this would be then the backup recovery, which I'm going to download and then going to our downloads. There we go. So following the instructions of the email, they said I must extract it and preferably run the application with administrator privileges. So, you know, it seems like a normal, legitimate application. It doesn't have anything funny in there. So we're going to run that as administrator. And now we're going to jump back to our cats and dogs and it will take about three to four minutes so just to explain um the whole revil ransomware so recently you're probably aware that there's been what they call the ransomware tsunami and like david and steven mentioned it exploited a weakness within the Kaseya VSA remote administration software. And yeah, once again, it's not necessarily Kaseya's fault. These exploits are what's called zero days. So they are exploits that, you see, the thing is, the attackers are always one step ahead. Well, more often like three steps ahead. But 
a zero day is the attackers will find an exploit that nobody knows about and they'll use that exploit to you know do whatever they want with the software so with revil like i mentioned earlier you get the ransomware that doesn't just corrupt your data it actually backs it up on their side and that's what makes revil different is revil backs the data up on the attacker side so they have leverage over your data so a lot of people these days they refuse to pay the ransom and rightfully so you shouldn't pay ransom but now the attackers are saying okay you don't want to pay the ransom we're going to sell your data on the black market so you better pay up if you still want your data and in that case having good protection and an external backup solution is crucial to to add to that mind what's what's quite funny is like the way laws are working these days is like if you if you don't pay your ransom which is actually the correct thing to do but yeah. you've had your data backed up elsewhere and they release it to the black market you're actually going to have a double whammy because you if you're if that data then gets releases released um depending on where you are you'll be breaching papier laws or gdpr laws so for sure first off first off you're not gonna you're gonna have lost your data and it will be released um externally and then the 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 relevant party is going to go oh that company's just had a had a breach um it means their cybersecurity wasn't up to scratch and well, now they're going to face a fine or go to prison or or whatever the story is, as, as it is with Papier and GDPR and a lot of the uh, states in the US are also implementing laws like that. Yeah. All right. Well, so... well, well, whilst that's happening, I just want to explain how does proper um, cybersecurity software work? So Mayan mentioned a zero day attack. What that means is a, a, a vulnerability that's, that's become... Um, known to, to cyber criminals between one update to one of your applications or your operating system and the next update. So what happens is as, as malware becomes known, um, uh, the, the, the vendors plug the gap. So whether it's Windows or whatever application, in that gap, you're vulnerable. What cybersecurity software does, it doesn't just look for patterns, it looks for behavior. If files are not behaving, or applications are not behaving in the way that they meant to. That's one of one of the ways you get warned. But whilst 100%. I'm saying that, as you can see, my yeah. tell us what actually happened. So yeah, yeah, you can see. So the ransomware I used is called Ryuk, and it's fairly old. It's been making a comeback recently, for sure. Not this. Yes. So the file names have been altered, but also the files have been changed to a .dot ryk file, yeah. and there is no application that can access said file except for obviously the attackers would have an application that they have written that can access RYK file. So then if you try and go into, you see, it will say, how do you want to open this file? And that's a good question because you can't. Okay. So opening the Ryuk readme, it will then pop up something saying Ryuk, balance of shadow universe. And then the contact information would be Download Tor browser, which you use to access the dark web. And then you would go to this onion link and that would be your password. And then on that link, it would have a cryptocurrency address, maybe like a Bitcoin wallet or Ethereum wallet or, you know, what have you. Right. So as you can see, Ryuk ransomware has worked its magic and has encrypted all of our precious dogs and cats photos in a real world environment this would be mission critical data and sensitive information which you wouldn't want to lose however don't lose hope just yet all is not lost luckily for you you use a backup solution and in this case i'm going to be using iron tree backup and with a backup solution, you can quickly and effectively recover a previous data backup. Now, the question has arisen quite a bit as to can ransomware infect my cloud storage as well? Because then what would, what would be the point? And simply put, no, it cannot. However, 
if these files well let me put it like this if auto sync is enabled and these encrypted files are backed up automatically to the cloud then yes this version of the backup with these files will be corrupted but your previous versions will be untouched so if you have a backup from earlier the morning or the previous day or whatever then that backup will remain untouched and you can simply restore that version of the backup and that's the beauty of versioning and most uh, backup solutions provide you with that power especially iEntry backup you are able to restore specific versions of data so if you know that this version of your data is going to be encrypted then you restore the previous version alright so once you have made your way to loveyourdata.za.intree.cloud you can come down to devices scroll down there and then over here you can decide which devices you'd like to recover so we're going to click on recover and that should take us to this pop-up over here you're gonna you can either run it as a virtual machine if you want to do some forensic investigation or scanning of it or whatever you please if your system has succumbed to a natural disaster and you don't have a physical machine to recover to you can run it as a virtual machine but we are going to recover it to our physical machine we're going to click on entire machine you can also recover specific files or folders if you so please we're going to recover the entire machine and it's going to prepare us for recovery so once that is finished i'll be back and just to show that our files are in fact still there and that our dogs and cats are still intact there we go there's our cute little dogs and cats they're all still there and I'm just as happy as these this dog and this cat I think it's a very relevant question for most of our listeners because I'd imagine that most of our listeners are using a version of Windows um, you know, I think part of the problem, though, is you've seen so many ransomware attacks, and I'm sure most people had their, their Microsoft uh, antivirus running. I would think that the hassle, though, is that your software, and you're going to talk about this later, always needs to be current. It needs yeah. to be on the latest version. Yeah. And very often people, you know, are a bit slack when it comes to downloading the latest patches to the operating system. So it's obviously great at the time that you installed Windows, and then it gets out of date and uh, i would see that as being one of the problems but it, it 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 would be certainly a very relevant question of mine as a listener yeah and i think exactly steve that we there is a slide further on where we like cover the, those issues so this slide is really to answer i'm sure some of the questions that you've been asking uh, how do you secure your, your environment password management we all know about uh, i don't know if we need to talk a lot about that I want to talk about the second one, which Stephen mentioned. Keep your applications updated. It's called patch management. What's important about that is they talk about common vulnerabilities. So as Stephen said, you might have installed Windows 10, you know, two months ago or a month ago. If you do not download those, those almost daily security patches, it's almost as if you've got an electric fence around your house, but one portion is missing completely. So you're protected 90% of your property, but the other 10% someone can walk through. What happens is, like normal criminals, cyber criminals look for com common vulnerabilities. So they've got automatic bots, as they call robots, which are trawling the internet, looking for vulnerable networks and vulnerable networks where there's not proper security and where there's unpatched applications or operating systems which have got that, that open door, which they can, can just walk through. Do you want to add anything to that, Steve? No. Okay. So make sure that your, uh, your applications are completely updated. Store proper cybersecurity. So to answer the one question that uh, Zach was, was answering live, 
Um, if you're running the latest version of your operating system, and typically it will be Windows, a lot of us use Mac, uh, which is a different story. It's, uh, if you've got the latest Windows patch installed and you're running Windows Defender, um, it will, I think mine safe to say that's gonna protect you 90 or 95% of the time. To be, to be a 99%, you need some soft so, so yeah. security. I'd say it's and, more like 80%. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, 80%, so the other 20%, you need proper cyber security. And to Stephen's point, what we've been doing at Iron Tree is providing a, a, a one size fits all, a kind of one yeah. solution in one management console that's going to give you your secure encrypted backup, that's going to give you the cyber security layer and the ability to not only stop attacks, but, but actually roll back when there is an attack, which is just almost impossible to, to stop. For example, um, the, the remote security software uh, ransomware, which, as I said, is, is not the fault of anybody, any user or any support company. User education, all of these things, I think, are, are pretty straightforward. Um, Steve, do you want to add to any of those other points? No, you know, Dave, I just think that inertia is a big problem here. That, you know, when somebody starts doing this, they do it properly, and then time goes by and they stop doing it properly. And you need to have something in your diary almost that says you will do this every 10 days. Um, because often people start off with all good intention and then life happens and people stop doing what I would say is the common sense stuff to keep yourself protected. But it's a hack. It's a schlep. And then people forget. And the next thing you know, you've got uh, a bit of a nightmare on your hands. It's all about consistency. Yeah, consistency. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, I think I want to add in one thing, one small thing. Um, first off, uh, when we go back to password management, we had a question earlier in the webinar, and I just want to answer that for everyone else in here. Um, you can't rely on browser password um, yeah. stores for your stuff. You've got to go for something like one pass or dash lane or um, yeah, dash lane, uh, an external password management program. Um, that kind of stuff, very crucial. And then secondly, just um, we're going to put up now for the rest of the chatting time, um, we've got a little bit more to say, but we're also going to put up a little survey with some uh, yes, no answers, uh, which we'd love to get some, some info from you. So if you can answer it now or minimize it and answer it when we finish, uh, that would be fantastic just so we can get, get to you um, and give you some proper info later on. Cool, Steve, take it away. Thanks, Zach. By the way, this, this poll is very important because Antri, as I said, we've got 15,000 customers and we're trying to really understand user behavior so that we can educate our base of customers more effectively. If you can please fill this thing out, it's going to take you 30 seconds. Okay. I just wanted to comment briefly. I'm not going to talk much about this slide because it's pretty straightforward stuff, but just to go back to a point that Zach made, I think we're all in this situation where we've got a million different passwords. We either use the same password in every application, which is absolutely the most dangerous thing to do, or every time we want to access an application or a website, we forget the password. Zach mentioned a thing like LastPass, or I'm not sure what the others are. There are applications which you can use, which will greatly assist you in managing your passwords. And if you need to know more about that, you can uh, email, um, the address, um, uh, it should be Zach at Iron Tree, like cybersecurity at Iron Tree. Uh, just in, email Zach and he will get Mayan to, to assist you with those kind of questions. What's a good password I mean, David, manager? Yeah. Sorry, Dave, I know that um, our Iron Tree at the moment is trying to do an in depth investigation what's the safest password manager to use. Because I've got to tell you, my mother in law is relying on me to uh, maintain her, her system at home. The passwords are an absolute nightmare. And um, it's actually become a massive inconvenience to people's lives. And just because there are like 0.0001% of the Earth's population who do these evil things, the rest of us get inconvenienced. And I'm looking for a very cool password manager that can at least help me be run my life more conveniently because I'm getting about 25 phone calls every day. Cool. We have run out of time a little bit. I mean, I'm happy to stay and if there are any questions. 
Yeah, I think just pop, uh, leave that second last slide up just so people have more time to digest what was on that it was up very briefly. But um, yeah, if you guys have questions, we'll sit and chat and questions and answers and answer anything that pops up for the next few minutes um, while people, if anyone has any questions and uh, don't have to run anywhere. Uh, Zach, I just want to have my last say here. Yes. For me, it was always a hassle running two separate applications, one for backup and one for antivirus ransomware. I think with Antry version two, and clearly I'm giving Antry a punter, I think it's just a very compelling solution to see all your vulnerabilities on one screen. Have your backups run properly, timelessly, how many threats were there, which devices were the threats on, because it's becoming a chaotic, noisy world. And the more central areas I can go to to actually view my threats, the better. Yeah. Also, Steve, I think you'd agree. The first point, they assume you will be hit. I mean, we see it every day. We, we are getting clients who are needing to recover their data every single day, at least one or two a day, because they didn't have layered cybersecurity protection in place. Um, yeah. Uh, where we've got clients who've deployed the Can I, proper cybersecurity, we, we just they, they don't have issues. And I want to tell you a very interesting story. We had a, a client about a month ago who uh, who did get hit with ransomware, and, and he accused us. He said, "But I'm running your cyber protection." And I still got hit with ransomware. Sorry, David, can I interrupt you? I just want to get some questions. These guys are asking questions and we need mine to please uh, get some of the answers going. We can fill in some stories uh, in the in the midpoint. But um, yeah, I'm busy typing answers, but okay, I'm not typing perfect, quick enough. I just, wanna, I just want you to answer them live so that everyone can hear because sure, sometimes no people don't see the don't see the questions and yeah, answers, no, sure. if that's cool. Um, so the first one, I think, is from from Brian Creel, um, his first, we touched on it earlier, how likely is it that the ransomware is contained in previous backups and after a, re a restore, the ransomware deploys again? So yeah. I think we touched on that with Revil, but if you could expand on that a bit more. Yeah, no, so and I was just typing a answer to him. Um, Perfect. So the chances of ransomware infecting your backup is slim. It's, it's possible, but it's very slim. So the, the good thing about specifically cloud backups is the cloud is hosted on a different computer. It's not necessarily on your computer. A cloud would be a remote server that hosts your data. So in the event that you are hit with ransomware, the chances of that ransomware spreading to your cloud backup service provider are very slim due to the fact that your computer isn't necessarily connected to that cloud server directly. You connect it over the internet, but not directly to that server. So if the cloud server gets attacked with ransomware, then your backup might be in danger. But if you get hit with ransomware and you want to recover it from the cloud, then I'd say it's about a 0.1% chance of your data wow. getting. I just, I've got to say this, people get confused with the ransomware attacking the cloud backup yeah. or your encrypted data being backed up. Now, obviously your encrypted data would be backed up. Yeah. You know, it's not that the ransomware has affected the cloud infrastructure where your backup is yes. placed. Yeah. But a backup will just see your data as data, whether it's encrypted or not. So what's very important there is you may have your latest encrypted data set being backed up, but then at least you've got version control in your backups yes. and restore from a version without the ransomware. What I don't want to call it ransomware, without the encrypted files. Yes. And then 100%. my I think what's also very important is if you Let's say you restore from a backup, you've got clean data. I would still format and my machine before I restore that data. Because yeah, because there might be yeah, know, there might be little remnants of the, the ransomware somewhere in the deep within yes. the computer. So I mean if I got hit by ransomware, I would format my machine, I would then restore clean backup. Yeah. Obviously, do this. I just with... quickly want to add. Sorry, Ryan, yeah, sure. I just quickly want to add to that exact point that you guys are making. So obviously we've got many experts 
uh, of, of Eintree listening to this call as well. So just got a mention here from Byron. So Byron specifically speaks about the safe recovery of version two. So prevent dangerous infections from reoccurring um, with the safe recovery technology. So during the recovery process, the integrated solution scans the backup for malware and installs the latest security patches and updates. So it is actually possible that the backup could also be a layer of, of full-on protection for you and re, uh, reoccurrence would, would be avoided then. Great point. I just want to add a, a little anecdote to that. I think you're right, Stephen. You should probably format your, your server if you get hit with ransomware. Um, two things. Firstly, you don't, you don't always know if you don't have the right layer de protection deployed. You don't know if there's actually an agent a Trojan horse type agent on your an on a device or server that will activate at some point in time. So that's the first thing. The second thing is some people will say that if you get hit and you pay the ransom, you will not get hit again because the cyber criminals will destroy any trace of their application yeah. on your on your server or your device because they don't actually want to be traced. But I just want to add to that as well, is that the cyber uh, crime has become such an industry that some of these guys in mind you will probably agree with me, they actually have call centers. So when you get hit, yeah. hit and the message pops up, you have been encrypted, there will be a number that you can call and speak to a call center agent. And they'll say, okay, well, do you want to pay this off? You can do it in installments. And it is a proper business. Yeah. Any other questions we need to answer, guys? There's been a, a lot of questions about um, Panda endpoint protection and AD360. So, mine, if you can chat about that as well. Um, what are the questions? So, asking if Panda is enough, if Panda will do uh, the right. same level of protection, uh, that kind let of me stuff. Answer that. Let me answer that, Zach. Yeah, sure. Panda endpoint protection is a fantastic traditional type of antivirus system with a little bit extra, don't give you a web filtering so you can bar access to certain websites, but it works on that traditional pattern type detection. So it's not just like a normal virus, an ESET type of, I don't want to mention the name, but which will, um, well, uh, at once a day. Panda is updated on a by minute basis. A360 is the proper size security. So it's one of the solutions. Uh, I'm trying to be agnostic and provide a, a range of good solutions. Panda 8360 adapted with N3. Fantastic. It works on blacklisting and wiping. It's it's a really good system. We had, we've got thousands of clients on AD360. We've never had a client that's actually been with ransom. And I'm back to this, was gonna, the client who got blamed us when we looked at a lot. Dave, your signal's not period. He died. Um, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yeah, I can hear you now, Dave. Okay, so the client in, in question had deactivated the 8360 agent to do something else on his server. And in the two minutes that it was deactivated before he, got, he activated it, the, the, the machine actually got compromised with ransomware. But apart from that, we think 8360 is a fantastic system. Yeah, to add to that, uh, 8360 is fantastic in its workings and it also it uses the whole heuristic and signature based detection so it also detects for strange behavior but if there are files that are flagged by sources as p potentially malicious then it will detect those signatures as okay that's a that's a malware file that i think the the best solution what i would recommend for everyone is email me. What we'll do is we'll get in contact with you and dependent on your needs, your solutions, um, we'll, we'll suggest the appropriate solution for you and your business specifically. Um, we're gonna have to wrap up now. Um, 
my email is zach, Z-A-C-H, at imtree.co.za. You're welcome to email me any questions. I'll be sending out a recording of this, of this webinar um, you, later today, once we've wrapped it up. You'll be able to respond to that with more questions, that kind of stuff. But uh, unfortunately, our time is running out and we need to wrap up um, the webinar. Thank you very much, Mayan and David and Stephen, for your time and uh, knowledge. Oh, and thank uh, you guys. yeah, thanks for everyone to attending. Uh, we'll get this recording to you and answer any further questions via emails or calls. All right. Thanks, guys. Cheers, Cheers guys.